Welcome everyone to what I hope is the first of many XCOM War of the Chosen challenge runs here on my YouTube channel. I'm the Drifter and today I'm wanting to answer the question, can you beat XCOM War of the Chosen using only sparks in combat? Well, the answer is no, because you need a human to use the Skulljack and on the Forge mission. Okay, more seriously, it turns out that's actually a pretty easy question to answer. But if we set ourselves a few ground rules, we can answer what is perhaps a more interesting question. Can you beat XCOM War of the Chosen using only sparks in combat, excluding story events? So the rules for this run are as follows. Rule number one, we can only use sparks in combat. Rule number two, we're playing on commander difficulty because Legendary is agonizing pain that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Rule number three, we're playing on Honest Man, which means we can only reload a previous save in the event of misclicks or glitches, not because the turn just didn't go the way that we wanted it to. And rule number four, a rookie can be taken on missions to complete story sequences only. So we can bring a rookie on a mission, they can move, they can use hunker down, and they can complete story sequences that the sparks can't, such as using the skulljack, but they cannot assist in combat, so they cannot attack outside of story events, and they cannot be used to draw fire. And just one final thing before we begin, I do live stream any challenge runs I do on my Twitch channel, so if you're interested in seeing the entire playthrough of any of these runs, please check me out over there. I'll leave a link in the description. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into this campaign. I believe we normally start XCOM War of the Chosen with 11 rookies in our barracks and one faction soldier. So I've replaced the 11 rookies with 11 sparks, and I've removed the faction soldier. After the first mission, I purchase a single rookie for completing story events when we need them. We won't be promoting this rookie for the entire campaign. Our sparks completely wreck advent on the first mission, and this is probably a good time to talk about how I expect this run to go. Sparks play very differently to other classes, and we're going to have some very helpful advantages and some major disadvantages. So firstly, Sparks can't be panicked, mind controlled, or succumb to any other type of battle madness. So this could make some of the psionic enemies, like the Warlock, much easier to deal with. Another thing is that Sparks are super powerful early game. They have high health, they inflict decent damage and shred with their primary weapon, they can shoot multiple times a turn with overdrive, they're immune to fire and poison, and they can each equip a heavy weapon, which is a rocket launcher by default. However, their main disadvantage is that they don't have any abilities for disabling enemies. So this means as the campaign progresses and we encounter enemies that have too much health to be killed in a single turn, such as gatekeepers and sectopods, we're going to have some trouble. So because of this, my main strategy in this run is going to be to try to complete the campaign as quickly as possible before the aliens start to regularly deploy more powerful enemies that simply outclass our sparks. To help do this, there are quite a few facilities and research trees we can ignore. Sparks can't use items, so most autopsies and similar research assignments we can skip. We won't need to worry about building an infirmary, AWC, Scilab, or resistance ring, as sparks can't make use of any of them. Now that leads us to a big disadvantage. Sparks can't use the resistance ring. That means no covert ops. So not only will that handicap our ability to slow down the avatar project and cause us to miss out on helpful rewards, but the biggest issue is that we can't hunt the chosen. This means all three of them are going to show up on the final mission. That's bad. Really bad. So again, this means we need to finish this run as quickly as possible, as the more time that passes, the more the Chosen are going to level up, and the more dangerous they're going to be. After the first mission, I start constructing a guerrilla tactics school, 
as we can still purchase squad size upgrades when we have high enough level sparks. I also begin research on alien biotech to progress the story as quickly as possible. The second mission is also a trouncing, even though the sparks do miss two 90% plus shots. But of course, that's XCOM, baby. And at one stage, I am concerned that we may take our first damage in the campaign because we can't kill a sectoid quickly enough. But thankfully, it decides to waste its turn by raising a zombie instead of shooting at us. So as a reward for the mission, we obtain our first engineer who we immediately put to work on increasing the construction rate of the GTS. We also get our first level ups. I want to give the Sparks a diverse set of skills, so I choose Bulwark on two and Adaptive Aim on the other two, even though Adaptive Aim is the superior ability. Third mission is a council mission from the Templars, and we have to leave an unconscious sniper behind because Sparks can't carry down to soldiers. But we don't really want any more non-sparks in the barracks anyway, so rest in peace to that sniper. We do obtain a scientist for successfully completing the mission, which will increase our research speed. We're able to complete the advent officer research, meaning we can build the proving grounds. This not only allows us to build the skulljack to advance the story, but it will also be our main method for obtaining better heavy weapons later in the campaign. Once the GTS is built, we put the engineer to work excavating for room so that we can build the proving grounds. We construct the proving grounds and begin work on the skulljack. We've almost made contact with the Black Sight region when we get hit with our first retaliation mission. The assassin shows up, but she's no match for our metal juggernauts. We save the region and have leveled our sparks up enough to purchase squad size 1 just in time for the black site. So this is actually going very well so far. Before we look at the black site, it's probably a good time to cover the main sparks that I plan to use. So first up is Spark 001, nicknamed Shield. This is the spark you obtain in the Shen's Last Gift DLC mission. Its primary role will be frontline combat, so far having learned Bulwark and Strike. Spark 002 is Julian, also from the aforementioned DLC mission, and it has a shooting role. It knows Adaptive Aim and Rainmaker, uh, so its shots will be more accurate, and its heavy weapon will be more dangerous. Spark number 3, better known as Party Pooper or PP, this one is named after a Twitch viewer also has a shooting role like Julian. And finally, Spark 004, nicknamed Medic, which, yes, is the most creative nickname in the world. Uh, we'll focus on being tanky enough to survive and on using Repair to help keep the other Sparks still functioning. It knows Bulwark and Rainmaker. Now on the Black Sight mission, I actually make a mistake thinking that Sparks can't pick up the vial. It turns out they actually can. But I didn't know that, so I bring four sparks in the rookie. Having five sparks would have obviously made the mission easier, as the rookie isn't allowed to attack. So we hit the black site, and having the assassin as the first chosen turns out to be a bit of a pain. Because she has stealth, and she can't stun or otherwise incapacitate any of the sparks, I'm worried that she may prioritise the rookie. So I'm constantly concerned that she's going to appear on top of the rookie and destroy him with a single hit. We actually get lucky as she chooses a terrible place to hide and we reveal her before she can get anywhere close to the rookie. The sparks take her out and we continue on. I end up splitting up my squad with half on the roof and half on the ground, which as many XCOM players will know, is a very bad idea in these games. Try to keep your squad together whenever you can. So I end up paying for it with a bad pot activation and we end up taking a hit, which is our first damage sustained for the run. It's not a big deal though, and we're able to get the vial and get out of dodge without any further issues. A couple of missions later and the Skulljack has been constructed, so I decide to equip it on the Rookie and go hunting for an Advent Officer in a Supply Raid mission. The rookie is allowed to attack the officer with the skulljack, but can't attack any other time during this mission. Now, at this point I've been playing for a couple of hours and I'm getting a bit tired, 
so I end up making a few silly mistakes, like forgetting to activate overdrive and stupidly setting up overwatch on the officer instead of using the skulljack. Thankfully the officer does survive the overwatch, but these errors make the mission much harder than it needs to be. So the officer has one health left and starts retreating towards another pod. As they are retreating, I'm having to try to keep up with the rookie while also not getting too close in fear the officer will turn around and shoot him. Some of the sparks end up having to protect the officer by shooting the lost that are swarming them since we need the officer alive to use the skulljack. The officer eventually makes it to the reinforcement pod and we take them out easily. By this point all the supply crates have been taken either by us or advent so we can at least take our time moving the rookie up. I actually found a good building for him to sneak up in while the officer is distracted by Lost and Sparks. PP ends up taking a hit and Julian loses almost half its health while providing the distraction. Uh, but the sacrifice does end up being worth it as our rookie successfully uses the Skulljack on the officer. A codex spawns in but we hit it with a double explosion and it doesn't have a chance to attack or clone itself. And that is mission accomplished. We complete construction of the shadow chamber but both Julian and PP need repairs. This raises another weakness of the sparks as they can only be repaired one at a time. A couple more uneventful missions go by and we level up enough to purchase squad size 2. Now we are regularly deploying 6 sparks on missions which is pretty amazing. I add another 2 sparks to the team, one being a shooter nicknamed Shooty, also an extremely original nickname, and another frontliner nicknamed Arnie because it looks like a Terminator. We expand into the Warlock's territory and we encounter him on a retaliation mission. And this is the first mission of the campaign that I can say goes genuinely badly. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that I'm trying to push forward to defend the civilians a bit too quickly. The map is also horrible with walls and trees blocking line of sight all over the place. So I end up being out of position for two simultaneous pot activations and I just can't get close enough to take them out before they hit back. The other issue, which is actually much scarier, is that now even the basic advent troops have 8 health instead of 4. I'm still using tier 1 weaponry and I just don't have the damage output to neutralize enemies quickly enough. So we bear through the pain and keep pushing forward. Again, there's just too much ground to cover and I end up activating a mech, but I can't get close enough to finish it even using overdrive. Now at this point I make a huge blunder and place PP on a tower that sits atop a bunch of explosives. And I knew this was a mistake when I did it, but at this point I'm just getting a bit frustrated. Not only with the long distances I'm having to cover, but also with the rockets. See, any object in the rocket's line of fire will prevent the rocket moving past. Now this includes half cover rocks and tables that you would logically thinking, assume the rocket can just fly over seeing as it's fired from shoulder height, well even higher on a spark since it comes from the bit. But it can't. So I'm surrounded by these rocks that barely come up to my spark's feet and they're blocking the line of fire on the rocket. So to get around this problem I move PP to high ground, uh, the mech ends up getting a turn and uses its missiles to level the entire tower that PP is standing on. So we almost lose this spark, but it hangs in with 3 health. Luckily I do have repair by this point, so we can keep PP in the fight, but it's going to be receiving repairs for quite a while. We push on and clean up the rest of the advent forces before going after the warlock. He's not too dangerous as he can really only summon helpers and shoot at us since we're immune to Mind Scorch. However, he's immune to explosions which is a bit annoying. We use a rocket to shred him and destroy his cover and then start unloading on him with all the firepower we can get in range, which isn't as much as I would have liked. He hangs on with 1 HP, of course, and retreats back into cover but the next turn we finish him off. 
We thankfully succeed at the mission, but I'm starting to get worried as Advent are just beginning to eclipse us on the tactical layer. The next mission only exacerbates my fears. But before we get to that, I do finish research on mag weapons, which has been delayed quite a bit because I've been opting for shadow chamber research instead. Unfortunately, we actually need gauss weapons to upgrade the Sparks guns, so we're still out of luck. Now here, I do get a lucky breakthrough research, which I opt to pursue, giving our mag weapons plus one damage. So this means when we do finally get our Spark Helix cannons, they'll be doing three extra points of damage rather than only two. Of course, we need to survive long enough for that to happen. So the next mission. Yeah, the next mission. We have a chance to stop the signal jamming event, which we really need to do because that will cripple our ability to make contact with other regions and complete story missions. The reward for stopping this dark event is 77 intel, which will actually help us contact new regions. So it seems like the perfect mission to take, right? Well, there's one catch. Yeah, so this mission has the surgical sit rep, which means we can only take three sparks out. Half of what we're used to fielding at this point. So we load up Shield, Julian and Shooty, and away we go. We encounter the first pod and a turret at the same time. They go down without issue, but we do burn through an overdrive with Julian, so that's five turns before we can use it again. The second pod I activate on a yellow move with Shooty, given Julian doesn't have an overdrive, and Shooty has used all its moves, we take a couple of hits here. On top of that, Advent call in reinforcements, and this mission is going brilliantly. On the next turn we hit back and wipe out the pod pretty easily, and we can even set up an overwatch with Shooty for the reinforcements, but Shield has also used its overdrive at this point. The reinforcements drop down and we miss with the overwatch. Even using our final overdrive on Shooty, we only just manage to eliminate the pod. So it's clear to me at this point that our lack of damage output is really handicapping us. The next turn we hack the objective and we have a 9% chance of halving our scanning times for the next four weeks. The RNG gods favor us on this day and we actually make the roll. I didn't think there was any chance of that happening, but we get the reward. So not only do we get to stop our scan times from being increased, we've actually decreased them on this mission. And I'm genuinely over the moon at the irony of this situation at this point in the game. Look, it's, it's a 9% chance, which is less than 1 in 10. It's like 1 in 11, not even, but let's do it. Yes! Oh my goodness, yes! Holy crap! That was so good! Shooty is our boy! and the package is secure eliminate any remaining hostiles oh yes i did not expect that i did not think there was any chance that was happening but it did and i'm stoked that's so good so that means not only are our scanning times not going to be increased they'll actually be decreased oh wicked 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 However, we're not out of the woods just yet, as there's one more pod to dispatch, and it has a mute on. Julian does have its overdrive back by now, but we're out of heavy weapons, and the mute on is set up in cover. Again, our low damage means we simply can't take out the mute on in time, and it ends up landing a melee attack on shield. On top of that, it shuts shield down for the next turn. Shooty and Julian are able to take out the Muton on the next turn, despite Shield being shut down. The remaining Sectoid, as usual, wastes its turn raising a zombie. We successfully complete the mission, but Shield and Shooty have both taken damage, and my concerns for the tactical layer are growing. Thankfully, we finish Gauss weapon research at this point and build the Helix Rail Cannon. And oh my goodness, the change is immediately noticeable. 
The next mission is a supply raid and we're back to six sparks on the field and we absolutely obliterate Advent with our new weaponry and then quickly hit the forge mission. I'm again taking the rookie here as he will need to carry a unit out which our sparks don't have the ability to do. Usual rules apply that he's not allowed to assist in combat and he's only allowed to complete that one specific story action. This does mean we're only fielding 5 sparks and I'm a bit concerned about the sector pod that always spawns in on this mission. But it turns out I had nothing to worry about. We smash the sector pod apart before it gets a turn and we trounce the warlock in similar fashion when he shows up. His zombies with spectral rupture slow us down slightly and Arnie does take a hit but we're never in any real danger. So we grab the body with the rookie and we book it out of there. The next few missions go off without a hitch and it's pretty clear to me at this point that our upgraded weaponry has been a real game changer. So before long we have another set of guerrilla ops and at this point we've completed enough shadow chamber projects to have the objective of using the skulljack on a codex. So I choose one of the guerrilla ops that features a codex spawn which I can see thanks to the shadow chamber, equip the skulljack on the rookie once again and we deploy for the mission. We set up on the roof of a house and were able to dispose of most of the advent forces without any issues. Here I deliberately leave the codex untouched as the rookie isn't in range to use the skulljack. Now this does allow the codex to attack us back and it hits three of our sparks with a psionic rift. The way psionic rift works is it disables your primary weapon. The game calls it disabling but it really just empties your clip meaning you have to reload. It does also leave an explosion area that detonates on the next turn, so you need to clear your units of the blast zone, otherwise they will take damage. More of an annoyance here than anything else, and we're able to use the Skulljack on the Codex on our next turn. An Avatar spawns in, and we take it out on the same turn. And it actually occurred to me here that I don't think I've ever been attacked by an Avatar in dozens of playthroughs of this game, as I always prioritise taking it out or disabling it so it can't attack. So I'm not actually sure how dangerous they are, but I'm guessing they're pretty bad as they're supposed to be Advent's strongest unit. Now during all this, the Assassin did spawn in. Um, sometimes her AI bugs out and she just stays still. Now this actually happens on this mission, so we end up having to spread our sparks all across the map, and it takes an unholy amount of time trying to find her. Eventually we do locate her and we're able to finish her on the same turn. We actually defeat her with a spark strike, which might be my favourite part of the campaign so far. We complete the plated armour research here, which allows us to get reinforced frames on our sparks, giving them more HP, which will come in very useful. And I now choose to focus on researching advent data pads to make sure we've got plenty of intel to make contact with new regions when we need to. Also, as we no longer need the rookie for any story sequences, I dismiss him from the barracks. He did serve us well, but his part to play is over. It was that Paul Green. He's got sideburns and like no hair. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go with him. We'll go with Paul Green. He's going to be the one rookie. Um, now she's probably going to try and target this guy. Finally. So we don't so we want him close to I think where he'll be safest I guess in here won't he like he should be pretty safe there just don't miss this skulljack imagine if after all this he misses yes Now with plated armor, I decide to hit the next story mission, which is the Psionic Gate. And this is a good mission to show off how limited our sparks can be in some situations. See, on this mission, chrysalids burrow into the ground and lie in ambush for you. When you get close enough, they burst out of the ground and charge your unit with a melee attack. Normally, I'd use battle scanners or bladestorm rangers to protect us from the melee attacks, 
but we simply don't have any way of blocking the ambushes on this mission with just sparks. So I'm forced to just charge in with some of the sparks, take the hit, and then heal afterwards. And sometimes the chrysalids actually hit quite hard, even though we've got armor. And the biggest problem here is that all these injured sparks are going to need repair time before they're back to full health. We're really close to the end of the campaign, and this could significantly slow us down. And it's at this point I'm realizing I really should have done this mission a lot sooner, so we had more time for those repairs. Now, the Hunter does debut on this mission, but I'm actually more worried about the Gatekeeper that I know is coming up. And sure enough, we make it to the Psionic Gate, and in comes the shiny spherical monster. And even better, we also activate a pod of two chrysalids at the same time. So I've made sure to save most of my overdrives and heavy weapons, as I knew that I'd be needing them for this part of the mission. I used two Rainmaker rockets to hit both the Gatekeeper and the two Chrysalids. The Chrysalids don't survive, and I then just go crazy on overdrives to hit the Gatekeeper with as much firepower as I can. Now the problem is not only that it has 25 health along with 6 points of armor, as if that wasn't bad enough, but the base chance to hit it with gunfire is very low, and we do have quite a few missed shots. The rockets obviously come in handy here as they're guaranteed to hit. We are able to take it down before it can hit us with any moves of its own. And now only the hunter is left. Or at least that's what I thought. So I start pushing forward to the hunter. He's behind full cover and I have the psionic gate between the sparks and him so I can't even get any rockets off on him. On top of that two more chrysalids pop up out of the ground. Shield takes a hit, but it's okay. Julian takes a hit too, and I'm actually not able to finish that chrysalid, so it hits Julian again on its turn. For the second time in the campaign, I'm afraid that we're going to lose a spark here, especially since Julian is one of the highest leveled that we have. It's now the hunter's turn, and he could destroy Julian if he chooses to. But thankfully, I have several sparks clustered together, so the hunter opts to lob a stun grenade into the group instead of going after Julian. And even better than that, our sparks are actually immune to stun, so the grenade does absolutely nothing. With the hunter having completely wasted his turn, we eliminate him and have mission success. Unfortunately, three of our sparks have taken damage. Julian's up for 24 days of repair before it's back to full health. Shield has 17 days and Shooty has 12. And that's really not good for this part of the campaign. With the Psionic Gate mission done, we can continue with Shadow Chamber research to advance the campaign. Meanwhile, we have a council mission to eliminate or capture Dark VIP. Sparks can't carry down units, so eliminate is obviously what we're going to go with. The biggest problem on this mission is that several of the Sparks are injured so I opt to take lower level sparks which have full health. In retrospect, this was probably a mistake and I should have just taken the injured units and burned through a few repairs to get them to full health at the start of the mission because they do have better abilities. I just didn't want them taking even more damage and then having to be repaired for even longer. So we get lucky and end up on the roof of a building overlooking both the dark VIP and the pod protecting them from above. I do make a mistake here and I move one spark up to launch a rocket into the pod and the VIP. The rocket takes out everyone except the heavy mech which activates overwatch. So this means I can't move any of the other sparks into position to attack without having to run the overwatch. It would have been a lot smarter to move a couple more of the sparks up before I broke concealment with the rocket but nothing I can do about it now. Arnie ends up getting hit by the overwatch, which means even more repair time for our squad. We end up taking out the mech, and here I immediately make another stupid play by moving one of the sparks off the roof to ground level. There's a pod of one Archon and two Mutons waiting for us right there, which now activates. I really should have waited for the next turn before I moved off the roof for this very reason. I just got a bit greedy because there was loot there which I wanted to advance on. We are able to take out both Mutons and then the Archon thankfully chooses to use Blazing Pinions. 
This is an AOE attack that we have a full turn to clear the impact zone of, and we won't take any damage. Really, the worst thing about this attack is that the Archon flies high into the sky to do it, which reduces the chance of hitting it with gunfire, and it also puts it out of range of heavy weapons. So I just unload into it with every spark I have, and even though we get a miss and a couple of dodges, we're able to eliminate it, and then move out of the impact zone of the Blazing Pinions. Straight after that, Advent drop in reinforcements, and this mission just keeps getting better and better. We take out the reinforcements, grab the loot, and start heading for the evac zone. We do activate the last pod, but we're in a really bad position to attack them because we've got a full cover car in our line of fire. So I opt to just evac out rather than going after the pod. We are still able to finish the mech before we exit, leaving the other enemies still intact. This mission really didn't go well at all, and it's simply because I was making bad plays. However, as bad as things may seem now, they're about to get much, much worse. See, we're pretty close to the end of the game, and there's normally a story event that has happened by now, and I'm actually really surprised that it hasn't yet. And that story event is, of course, the Avenger Defense Mission. So after you complete the black site, Advent sends a UFO to hunt you. When it finds you, it disables the Avenger and you need to defend your ship from an Advent capture crew. And now, with more sparks injured than what we've ever had in the campaign up until this point, of course the defense mission activates. Now, this mission is the reason that I've wanted to avoid having non-sparks in the barracks, because during the mission, Bradford will send out reinforcements from the ship. Obviously, if he sent any non-sparks, we wouldn't be able to use them, and it would be a waste of a reinforcement. So by having only sparks in the barracks, we're guaranteed to get reinforcement troops that we can actually use. I send out our uninjured Sparks, along with Shudi, Shield, and Arnie, even though they're not yet at full health, but I opt to leave Julian behind, replacing it with a lower level Spark, because its health is just way too low. Now, having only Sparks here forces me to change my playstyle drastically for this mission. The basic objective of the mission is that you have to move your units out to the device jamming the Avenger systems, destroy it, and then make it back to the Avenger platform so your troops don't get left behind when you take off. There is a couple of catches, of course. One is that once you destroy the device, and possibly even before the device if you're too slow, Advent reinforcements will start dropping in with increasingly large pods until you're simply overwhelmed. So this means you have to race back to the Avenger as quickly as possible, the other issue is that if any Advent forces end their turn on the platform, it counts as a victory for Advent, and you lose the entire campaign. Not just the mission, the entire campaign. So defending the platform while you go after the device is key. Normally my strategy is to keep the majority of the squad on the platform, and move one to two stealth rangers or reapers up to the device, then either use the stealth units or snipers with squad sight to destroy the device. Obviously I can't do that here because I don't have any rangers, reapers or snipers to work with. So instead I just split the squad up into two, one on defense protecting the Avenger and one on offense moving up to the device. We start pushing forward and naturally encounter a few pods and I do have a confession to make here. Without thinking, I use one of the Avengers turrets to take down a Berserker. I don't really have an excuse for doing this, I just wasn't thinking and momentarily forgot that a turret doesn't count as a spark. I immediately realised my mistake and I did try to reload the turn to avoid using the turret, but the game had stopped auto-saving on this mission, so I couldn't without having to do the whole mission again. It was only one enemy, and it wouldn't have done much damage even if it did survive for a turn, so I decided it wasn't worth having to play the whole mission over, and I continued on. Didn't use the turrets again, so I hope you can forgive me for this oversight. Anyway, we make it to the device and take it out. 
a spectre is still alive which I decide to ignore and just start double timing it back to the Avenger. The spectre doesn't show up again and I think its AI may have been having issues because there's no human targets for it to clone. Advent more than makes up for that by dropping several reinforcement pods right on top of us as we're moving back to the ship. We're never in too much danger though and I do even take a quick detour to grab some loot on the run back. Our sparks have taken some damage but all of them are evac'd out successfully and we've avoided having the entire run ended by a single mission. So that's pretty good I guess. So we're getting pretty close to the end game and we're essentially just waiting for our shadow chamber research to complete. I do wish I had been faster with this research but we need to wait for our sparks to be repaired anyway so I guess it doesn't really matter. Final mission is really the only thing left that I'm worried about at this point, and I'm very, very worried about it. We begin work on the final Shadow Chamber research of the game, and acquire Tactical Analysis as a continent bonus, which could be a lifesaver, quite literally, on that final mission. Basically, the way Tactical Analysis works is that if you reveal a pod on your turn, on the next alien turn the pod loses an action point, so generally they can either move or attack, but not both. Uh, it's a very good ability and it could be a game changer for that final mission. We hit a Guerrilla Ops mission while we're waiting and things are going quite well until the Warlock shows up. I knew it was a mistake when I did it, but he was behind indestructible full cover, so I sent a spark out to finish him with a strike. The thing I was worried about by doing that is activating another pod, and that's exactly what happens, and on top of that, the pod has an Andromedon in it just to make things even better. So I'm relying on tactical analysis, and I move as many sparks as I can to be outside line of sight so the aliens can't shoot at us. At least I think they're out of sight. Arnie's standing behind a wall, but somehow the Andromedon can still see him, it attacks, and here Arnie falls, and we lose our first spark of the campaign. This was really frustrating, because there was really no way that that Andromedon should have been able to see us. I'll leave the footage here, and you can judge for yourself, but it felt like a very cheap death to me. But, fair or not, Arnie is our first casualty. Lights out, lying in And we immediately rebuild it as Red Arnie, or Rani for short. But this new unit is obviously at a much lower level. As we're approaching the end of their campaign, it finally sinks in that our sparks aren't all going to be repaired in time. So I decide to delay the final mission for a little so I can research powered armor. This will give our sparks an HP buff, and help negate the fact that they're not going to be at full health. While leveling up a few of the lower level sparks, I also give them the repair ability when I otherwise wouldn't have. This will be another way to help to mitigate that HP loss. During the stalling time, we get a UFO supply run mission. Things are going well on this mission until a sectopod shows up. And now that sectopods are spawning on regular missions, I know Advent is almost at full force level, meaning gatekeepers could start spawning shortly. Things seem pretty dire until Julian's repeater activates on the sector pod and one-shots it. Oh, Julian, yes! Yes! Did you see that? Oh, Julian with the one-shot. Oh my god, Julian. I would kiss you if you really existed, man. Oh, yes. 
Oh, Julian is our boy. Julian is the hero of this run. Which is ironic when you first meet him, he's trying to kill you, but... This was an insane clutch move and really turned the tide of the battle. Because of this, I end up putting repeaters on three of my sparks for the final mission. Now, the way repeaters work is they have a 5 to 15% chance of executing an enemy regardless of how much health is left. Normally, I don't find them to be that useful, but given the sparks can shoot multiple times in a turn, it drives up the chances of the execution activating even higher than it would on a normal soldier. Our powered armor research completes, and the assassin levels up enough to attack the Avenger, so I decide we're out of time and can't stall any longer. We head out for the second last mission. We do get some useful power-ups with the intel, including being able to field four troops instead of three, and having the run and gun ability on everyone. I send Julian and Shield as well as two lower level sparks. I don't want to send only high level sparks in case we get into trouble and end up needing one of the lower level sparks to take a hit. This will leave us with the A-level sparks still at as high HP as possible for the final mission. I move forward fairly slowly in this mission as there's no time limit imposed. Everything goes well and we're ready for the final mission before too long. And this is going to be by far the most difficult part of the campaign. So we load up Shield, Julian, PP, Shooty, Medic and one of the backups, now named Giga, for the final mission. I should also say that this is an all or nothing mission. If we lose, the campaign is over. With that out of the way, here we go. Now, we do have the commander's avatar on this mission, but as it's not a spark, we can't use it, just like the rookie. So the most powerful unit we have is forced to sit at the back and powerless to help. Just fantastic. My plan is to overwatch creep, meaning move up in very small amounts and then overwatch, allowing us to ambush the aliens as they patrol into us, rather than us patrolling into them. This works really well for the first pod, consisting of two mutons and an archon, we actually finish the Archon on the Overwatch and leave the Mutons with very little health so it's easy to mop them up on our next turn. Things don't go quite so well on the second pod. And when I say don't go quite so well, I mean we activate a Gatekeeper and six Chrysalids on our turn. I take a couple of shots with Overdrive at the Gatekeeper and then fall back. The plan is to rely on Tactical Analysis to move away from the Gatekeeper. Some of the Chrysalids are closer to us, so I use the Sparks that are already out of line of sight on the Gatekeeper to take them out. But apparently I haven't moved far enough back and the Gatekeeper launches an AoE attack that inflicts 6-7 to seven damage on 4 of our Sparks. Now this is absolutely dreadful for this early in the mission. See, our repairs and rockets are limited use abilities. One in the case of rockets, two in the case of repairs. The final mission is long, and having to use our repairs this early puts us in a really bad spot for the rest of the mission. And as if all that wasn't bad enough, the assassin decides now is a great time to drop in. Reluctantly, I use a rocket to hit three chrysalids at once, one falls and I mop up the other two with gunfire, I fall back even further and use three of the total six repairs I have. The gatekeeper advances and shoots at us, but thankfully misses. I focus fire on the gatekeeper, and despite missing a few shots, we do take it down. There's one chrysalid that has followed us, but we finish it off easily. Just as we've recovered from that ordeal, we stumble into the assassin. She's actually taking cover on one of our sparks that has bulwark, so it makes no sense that we wouldn't have seen her coming. But I guess that's XCOM, baby. Now, something interesting to note here. The Assassin has over 50 health and appears to be at maximum level. The whole reason for rushing through the campaign as quickly as I could was to finish before the Chosen reach maximum level. But I guess they're at max on this mission regardless of what they were at before. Now this could be a real problem that I didn't foresee. My overdrives are still on cooldown, so I'm worried about not being able to take out the Assassin even with every spark shooting at her. However, Medic takes the first shot and scores with the repeater execution, so our days of worrying about the Assassin are over. For this run at least. Now just when I think we're safe, the last Chrysalid had actually burrowed underground, or under metal flooring, go figure. It bursts from the ground and attacks, but thankfully misses. We then finish it off and can finally move past the first area of the map. 
We move forward sticking to the Overwatch creep strategy and we damage an entire pot of mechs and advanced mechs but don't actually finish any of them. It's not a big deal and they're easily dispatched on the next turn. We move forward and unveil another pod made up entirely of mechs. I again opt to use the fallback and rely on tactical analysis strategy so the mechs waste their turn moving into my line of sight. This time the plan actually goes to plan and the mechs follow us instead of attacking and take a few of our overwatch shots for good measure. On my turn we hit them back hard and finish them off. We move forward and take position on a roof. Now at this point one of my coolest Twitch viewers, Nerd Poker Girl, tells me to be careful of fall damage as we activate a pod of an Andromedon and two Codexes. I tell her we'll be all good. <laughs> I thought I had a good plan here by focusing on the Andromedon to damage it enough to change it into its second form, which normally isn't too much of a threat. Once I've done that, I focus on the Codexes and finish them both, getting another lucky execution. With only the Andromedon shell left, I think I'm good, but what I've failed to realise is there's a pipe right next to my Sparks that the shell can use to climb up to us. It uses a punch attack, destroys the floor, and three sparks go falling to the ground along with the shell. Yep, I should have listened to you, Nerd Poker Girl. Thankfully, we've taken minimal damage and we can finish the shell easily on the next turn. Having learned nothing from that previous experience, I immediately send the sparks back onto the roof, and here we kind of get stuck in a standoff. I can hear a pod moving in front of me, so I remain where I am and set up the Overwatch ambush, but the advent forces just don't seem to be coming any closer, so I'm eventually forced to creep forward. This is pure nightmare fuel as we activate two sector pods along with a few mechs. I don't really know what to do here, so I fall back away from the sector pods. I think it's one of those out of sight, out of mind situations. I know the sector pods are still there, but if I can't see them, then I'm fine, right? Right? <laughs> I take out the mechs that I can see and then get ready for the incoming onslaught. The first sector pod marches in but thankfully wastes its turn on an AoE attack that we're out of range for. One of the mechs uses rockets and we again fall to the ground. Maybe one day I'll learn my lesson, but it is not this day. And now as if two sector pods wasn't bad enough, the hunter drops in. He also has over 50 health and appears to be at full level. This just keeps getting better and better. So at this point, I'm ready for it to be game over. I really can't see any way that we can survive a Chosen, two sector pods, and a group of advanced mechs. Ah, but friends, sometimes the RNG gods taketh away, and sometimes they giveth. Not two seconds after the hunter is spawned in, he eats an overwatch and we get another lucky execution. The repeater is now triggered on both Chosen, and this is fantastic news. I just imagine the hunter here drops into the mission, he's standing around bragging, not realising the spark is locked onto his head, and then splat. I don't get too excited though, as we're still far from being out of the woods. Reluctantly, I decide it's time to use some more rockets, and I'm able to hit the sector pod and three mechs. We then try to finish the sector pod off with Julian, and we get a fourth execution for the mission, immediately disposing of the sector pod. We take out the last of the mechs to survive the rockets, but it's now time for the second sector pod to enter the fray. I do consider using sacrifice on shield, meaning any damage the surrounding sparks take will be redirected to it. The only reason I hold off is because it still has a rocket, so we don't want to lose it just yet. The sector pod shoots twice, but thankfully misses both times. We're getting really lucky here. On our turn, we charge forward and hit the sector pod with everything we have. I am worried though, as we're out of overdrives and we may not have the sheer firepower required to take this thing out. But Jake Solomon truly favours us on this day and we trigger a fifth execution, taking the sector pod out. This is just absurd at this point. Every major enemy we've encountered, apart from the gatekeeper, has taken an execution shot. I'm really not sure we would have made it through that last part without some serious luck, but we did, so let's take it and move on. We're now forced into the final chamber, where we need to take out three avatars in order to win the mission and the campaign. I make a huge blunder here and I push forward into the first pod before my overdrives have come back from cooldown. I was afraid reinforcements would start spawning in, which is why I rushed, 
but it made things far more difficult than it would have been otherwise. So we activate the first pod of an avatar and two archons. I do have one overdrive which I use, but the avatar is positioned in full cover and not easy to get to. On top of this, whenever we hit it once, it teleports to a new location. I am able to take it out on the first turn, but it takes a rocket and two bombards to do it. This is going to leave us with very limited options for the next two avatars when they spawn in. The reinforcements start dropping in with a squad of three mutons as well as the warlock. And you guessed it, he's also at max level. The warlock is the least dangerous of the three chosen for us, so there is that, but we're still in major trouble. I hit the warlock with a rocket to shred him and destroy his cover, as he is immune to explosions. I then go for a strike with shield but miss. My luck with him is certainly not as good as the other two chosen. We then miss another strike on one of the Archons. Thankfully, Julian makes up for this by executing the second Archon from full health. Yes, another execution. Should have used that shot on the Warlock. We're not able to finish the second Archon thanks to another miss, so start heading towards the Warlock. However, on the next turn, the Avatar drops in, so our attention turns to it. There's also a pod of several Faceless, but we're not too worried about them. Now, here we get some more insane luck. Giga has Intimidate, and the way Intimidate works is that enemies who attack have a chance to panic after the attack. And the chance to panic actually increases based on what tier of armor you have. So early game the ability is not that helpful, as the enemies rarely panic. But with tier 3 armor, well, just watch what happens. The Archon and all three Mutons attack Giga, and all of them panic. We do take a couple of hits, but having four enemies disabled for their next turn is more than worth it. And even better is that one of the mutons hits the avatar with a grenade. This not only shreds it and does a little bit of damage, it causes the avatar to teleport closer to us. I fire at the avatar and miss three out of three shots with Julian, which was a total waste of overdrive, and so I have to send PP over to attack the avatar with Nova. I wanted to avoid going over to that side of the map since it's full of enemies that will attack when their panic wears off, but there's no way around it. I hit the avatar with another Nova from Medic and then used the last of my rockets on it. Things are coming down to the wire now. I'm able to get a flanking shot at point blank range on the avatar with shield, but it misses again. And shield is really letting us down at this point. So no one else is close enough to attack and so the avatar for the first time ever in my over 1,000 hours playing this game, and God knows how many campaigns, gets to attack me. And this is a big indicator to me that we're in real trouble at this point. Just the fact I couldn't take it out in a single turn, even with all my units focusing on it, is a situation I've never been in before. Even when I couldn't end it on the first turn in the past, I was at least able to disable it with a frost bomb or stasis or something like that. This situation means we can't handle what Advent is throwing at us. So the Avatar hits shield with a null lance for big damage. The Warlock also shoots at shield, but its armor allows us to avoid most of the damage. Even so, shield is down to 4 health. Thankfully, shield makes the shot on the Avatar on the next turn, but it actually heals missing health every turn so we don't finish it. Shooty also takes a shot and thankfully hits, but the avatar dodges and so survives on 1 HP. The tenacity of this thing is just unreal. Medic is out of bullets and I don't want to miss, so I instead opt for a Nova attack. Now, with Nova, it is a free attack, but after the first time using it, it also does damage to your spark. And the damage increases with each use. So we finally take out the second avatar, but Medic does take some damage. In retrospect, this was a really dumb move. I had actually forgotten that Medic had a stock, so if it had missed the shot, we would have downed the avatar anyway. I was pretty stressed at this point, so probably wasn't thinking clearly. I opt to use the final repair of the mission on shield, and we turn the spark's attention back to the warlock. This is not only to try and take the warlock out, but also because the opposite side of the map is now swarming with enemies, so we want to get as far away from them as we can. So the final avatar spawns in, and it's all or nothing. 
There's no way we can finish all these enemies, so we have to focus on the avatar and hope we can finish it on our next turn. More enemies attack medic and it gets whittled down to 2 health, but does make some of those enemies panic. The warlock again shoots at shield and if we hadn't repaired it, shield would be down right now. This will turn out to be vitally important before the mission is over. The avatar is in full cover and we've got no way of destroying it. I go for a Hail Mary shot with Shooty, and it thankfully hits, causing the avatar to warp away. And now it truly is the 11th hour. I decide to move Medic in close to the avatar and activate Nova, knowing it will destroy Medic in the process. The chat and I say our goodbyes to our big metal buddy, and I send him out on a one-way mission. Or not. I didn't know that cover actually stops Nova, but it turns out it does so we can't attack. Medic gets to hang around a bit longer, standing there uselessly instead of sacrificing itself. And at this point, I'm totally losing my mind. <laughs> the cover stops the move from working. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay then. Of course it does. Why wouldn't it? Oh, of course, of course. So we move to a flanking shot with Giga, and the reason I opted for Medic to attack in the first place was because its gun was still empty of clips and I didn't think it would have another chance to attack. I was trying to save the other sparks as they had more options. Thankfully Giga makes the shot and then Julian does the same. The avatar teleports again into a terrible position right behind shield which has the flank and the high ground. It's a 100% hit chance and shield takes the shot. The final avatar is wiped out and we win the entire campaign using only sparks. What's more, we didn't lose a single spark on the final mission. I genuinely didn't think that would happen. And what a victory. If I hadn't used that final heal on shield, the warlock would have destroyed it and we wouldn't have had the flank on the avatar. After being so useless that mission, shield redeems itself and wins us the whole campaign. So there you have it. Yes, it is possible to beat XCOM 2 or the Chosen using only sparks in combat. Minus the one slip up with the turret, but we won't speak about that. Honestly, this run went about as I expected. The early game was a breeze and the late game was horrific. If it hadn't been for those lucky execution shots, I'm not sure we would have pulled this one off. The biggest takeaways, I think, are rushing to the final mission was a mistake. Given the chosen a max level on the final mission anyway... I would have been better off building some powered heavy weapons to be inflicting more damage, and I could have waited for my sparks to be repaired and at full health. I think I also slept on Nova for way too long. I've always avoided using that ability due to having to be so close to the enemy and it doing damage to the spark after the first use, but it came in clutch here and I wish I would have made better use of it along the way during the campaign. Also, stacking the repeaters on the whole squad can be really useful. I might have just been super lucky. I mean, I was super lucky, but those repeaters really saved us. I'll probably use them on sparks more often in the future as they pair really well with units that can shoot multiple times. Well, that about does it. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. I've been streaming on Twitch for the past few months, but this is my first time ever making an edited video like this for YouTube. I'm sure it's a bit rough around the edges in some parts. Even as I was making it, I looked back on previous parts of the video and thought about how I could make them better. I'm happy to take any feedback you might have, so please leave your thoughts in the comment section. And if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like. I'm already working on my next challenge video, which will be another War of the Chosen run, but this time using only Templars. So if you'd like to see more of these videos, please subscribe to the channel as they will be coming. And remember that you can see these challenge run playthroughs in full on my Twitch channel, so please give me a follow over there if you're interested. And finally, if you've got any suggestions on challenge runs you'd like to see, 
please drop them in my challenge run suggestions channel on my Discord. The link is below in the description. You can also leave ideas down below in the comments, but the Discord is the best place to do so as I check that regularly. Thanks again and take it easy.